Christ's name, amen. Amen. Well, I am so glad to be with you. Yeah, turn that down a little bit so I can holler. <laughs> um, I have spent my whole life doing this. This has been my, uh, my call from the very beginning. I remember at 21 sitting in a church in Bel Air, Texas saying, you know, I think I want to be a Bible commentator. I thought, <laughs> who does that? So um, the Lord has led me down a wonderful path. I want to share that path with you. But I, I want to make a couple of rules. Uh, please uh, feel free to get up uh, anytime you need to. Uh, coffee, bathroom, uh, throw up outside, come back. <laughs> um, I want to be as open and honest with you as I can. Now, the good thing about that is I'm going home, you know, Sunday afternoon. And uh, so I, I'm going to be as transparent as possible. But please, please, I, I'm going to give you the best I have. But I know, you know, I'm smart enough to know that I don't know. So I have struggled with this. This is not in concrete. Um, but I hope it'll be a blessing to you. I, we're going to have time for questions. You can ask me anything. I'm not going to try to embarrass you. I, I don't want you to embarrass me. I'm not, we're not going to fight. Amen. So um, I love the Bible. I love Jesus. I want to know him better so I can live better to please him. And I want others to go to heaven with me. I mean, that's, that's where I'm coming from. I think this all started when I first surrendered to preach. And I struggled with um, what is the gospel? What is truth? And even in my little church, it became very obvious that people didn't agree on the Bible. Um, I did my doctorate in Chicago. And I remember hearing D.A. Carson say, we fight over the Bible is inerrant. And then we can't agree on anything it says. That's self-defeating. So I want to try to make as practical as possible how someone approaches an ancient, an ancient text, understands it, and applies it to themselves. Okay? Now, th this is not as easy a process as it might seem. Uh, because many people read the Bible like the morning newspaper, written in English, written to them, them. And it's not. The Bible was written for you, but not to you. And the only way we can understand it is to understand what the original author, who is the only inspired person, I'm screaming now, the only inspired person in Bible study is not your mother, not your preacher, and not your denomination. The only inspired person is the original biblical author. Now, if I found one of your uh, Valentine letters from junior high school, five pages of drippy, gooey, I'll love you forever to the girl that sat next to you, if I found that, and I read two sentences off the third page, how much could I embarrass you? You would say to me, Bob, wait a minute. You've got to read that whole letter. You've got to know when I wrote that and who I wrote that to. God is screaming that at us. Because Americans are terribly guilty of pulling one little verse, one little phrase, one little word, putting a Baptist spin, an American spin, a 20th, 1st century spin, and saying, thus saith the Lord, and God's throwing up over it. A book that can mean anything means nothing. America is abysmally ignorant of the Bible, but they think they know it. And we'll split churches over a little verse that nobody knows what it means. Now, please, please, I am a type A introvert, which means <laughs> I don't want to be in a bus with anybody for two hours, but I tend to be exuberant, okay? Okay. So please let me present this with my enthusiasm, but do not interpret my enthusiasm as dogmatism. And I am not dogmatic about this, but I am enthusiastic about this. So my goal is not that we agree. Amen? I'm not trying to convert anybody to my view, but I am trying to cause you to think. I hope when you leave, if you say, oh, I enjoyed that, you are a strange person because I am, <laughs> I am not here for you to enjoy it. I want you to say to yourself, where did he get that? I'm going to check that guy. And there is one source of authority for us. Amen? So I think it's fair for me to ask anybody who claims to speak for God, can you show me in the Bible where you got that? 
Give me time to pray about it. Give me time to look at it. And then I'm responsible for the light I have to walk in that truth. Amen? So we're not looking for... Well, I think we've confused uniformity <laughs> uh, for unity. <laughs> we're to remain unified, but we are, we're not going to see the Bible the same. And really, I think it's God's wonderful way. The people in this room are not going to agree on everything I talk about, I assure you, because I'm going to bring up every controversial thing you ever thought about to keep your interest and to show you valid conservative alternatives. But our diversity may be God's wonderful way of reaching diverse lost people who think differently and look at the world differently. I mean, you, you are fully equipped to reach people for Christ that I could not reach. But I hope you give me the dignity that I have the same position, that I can reach people with my understanding for Christ. Because the goal is what? The Great Commission. Amen? <laughs> it's not who passes the test when you get to heaven. It's, it's how many are going to get to go with you. <laughs> and how have you lived for him? Okay. Well, David, thank you for praying. Uh, I believe if the Lord's not here, nothing's going to happen, right? I mean, the only teacher we really need is the Holy Spirit. But I must admit to you, why are we, why is the church in such disagreement? I mean, we pray, we love the Bible, we want to understand it, we want to live for him. Then why is there a church on every second corner that won't talk to each other? I mean, what has happened to us? The Reformation was a wonderful thing, but what it did is turn one pope into everybody's a pope. And now we think we have the right to do anything in God's name because we think it. We just don't have the right to tear up the kingdom of God over personal opinions. We just don't. But we need to think about how can I be a better interpreter of the Bible. So uh, this, is, uh, this is the course I taught. You just can't imagine, David, how many guys say to me, boy, I wish I'd have listened in your class. <laughs> you know, really, education is wasted on the young. You know that, right? It's when you experience the real world, you think, oh, I wish I could have gone back and thought about that. Because today, students want to get out as easy as they can and get on with it. And, of course, what we as teachers want to do is get them to think about this subject in depth and see how it applies. So... Um, I really, really think about this every day. I mean, I've changed this notebook um, just so many times. I would, I would love to hear your comments. If something is confusing or not, under, not understandable, please, please uh, give me the, uh, the, the honor of telling me so I can fix it. Amen? Because uh, this has become the goal of my life now is helping people understand the Bible for themselves and then walk in that truth. This course is meant to do two basic things. One, I'm staying at the Antlers Inn, so it's, a, it's got the railroad train there. It's meant to be a tract, a railroad track for you to follow when you interpret the Bible. I'm going to give you a series of principles and methods for how you should approach Scripture when you study for Sunday school or a sermon or whatever. It's also meant to be a shield because there are really a lot of strange religionists that claim to speak for God that are absolutely unbiblical. And they trick God's people so easily because God's people do not know the Bible for themselves. So it's a shield and it's a methodology. So if you'll see that is the purpose of this from the very beginning, then I think it'll make our time together more productive. I'm going to start on page 9 of your notes. Now the first few pages are basically a summary of all I'm going to do today. So after today... When you have a, a little time, you might want to read these few pages and see if you've kind of get to the gist of what I'm trying to say and how I think we ought to proceed when it comes to how do we understand an ancient book that is the only clear self-revelation of the one true God. That, that's what we're looking for, okay? Now, on page 9, you have an introduction, so I, I'm just going to work through this. Uh, I kind of think we'll try to go an hour and 15 minutes Take a 15-minute break and come back and do that again. Okay, that'll give you a chance to get up and walk because your mind can't absorb but your seat can't stand. I understand that. Please feel free to get up and move. And um, I'm not going to take questions at first because what I'm going to do these first couple of hours is try to slap you as hard as I know how. Because I've got to convince you we're not doing it well for you to let me try to give you a new approach. And... Uh, I almost want to say, if you can't come back this afternoon, you probably ought to go home now. Because um, 
I'm going to try to tear things up this first few hours. But I'm going to tear it up to try to give you a better way to do it. And if you're a brand new Christian, I think you probably ought to go home now. Because this is not for new Christians. This is for Christian seeking maturity, okay? Because I'm going to push you, and I'm going to stretch you, and I'm going to slap you. And if that bothers you, you invited me. Okay? Because I think American Bible interpretation is maybe the weakest I've ever seen. I love to come to groups like you because um, I just got back from Mexico. I taught at a Methodist seminary in Monterey. Um, when you have people who want to learn, it's so much better than having people who can't wait to get out of class, you know. And so you're here on a Saturday because you're motivated. I thank God for you because you are going to be able to influence your family, friends, and grandchildren with this. And I pray this doesn't just go in a couple of days. I, I, I am trying to infect you for life with a better way to understand the Bible. Not my way, not my views, but a way to approach an ancient book so that you can verify to others, why do I believe this? And let them pray about it and search for themselves, okay? The desperate need for personal Bible study. Most Christians do not know the Bible because they have never studied it personally. I would submit to you, if we took, a, took just a sample of American Christianity and asked them, how long has it been since you read a book of the Bible? All of us would go crawl in a hole somewhere. We say the Bible is the self-revelation of God, and we spend more time watching TV than we ever do reading the Bible. We knew more of the people on our soap opera than we do the characters of Scripture. And yet we claim it's the word of God that affects our eternity. And we've got, we've got every color to match every shoe we have. We've got it on the coffee table. We've got it in four translations. And we never pick it up and read it. This book is not holy. This book, this book is wood, dead animal skin, and ink. What's holy is the message. But the message must be read. Its presence doesn't help you. It's the message that's meant to affect you. So Americans are not studying the Bible themselves. They say to themselves, I go to church mostly, and I go to Sunday school sometimes, and that's enough. If that's all you get, you are an anemic Christian. Because I hear people say all the time, David, my pastor doesn't feed me. Who told you your pastor was supposed to feed you? You're supposed to feed yourself. This book was not given to the leadership of the church. This book was not given to the university. This book was given to you. You, the Bible, and the Holy Spirit have priority. That's why you cannot pick up a commentary first. Because then you're grabbed by the nose, by the opinions of that writer. God saved you. You have an experience with him. You have an entree to others that no one else has. The Bible is meant for you. It's your book. Do not let somebody take that book out of your hands. But you must know what it says before you know what it means. And the only way to know what it says is to read it or listen to it on tape if, you, if you're a, a, an audio listener or, or watch somebody on TV read it. But we've got to get back to it, not someone's opinion about it because it is priority. Okay, number two, most Christians only know what they've been told by others. You know, I think we have wonderful students at uh, East Texas Baptist University, and you ask them a question, and I think they give you what I think is a good conservative answer. Then you ask them, can you show me where you got that? Then it starts coming up, favorite preacher, a green book on the left side of the page, mother, family traditions, denominational preaching, now, friends, all those are fine, but they're not authoritative. Amen? You've got to, I think it's fair for me to say to you, can you show me in the Bible where you got that? I remember years ago, I was down in Orange, Texas doing something. I used to go every year there and do Bible studies, and this lady said to me, you teach the Old Testament? I said, yeah. She said, where does it say you can't sell your dog? I said, well, I don't think it says that. She said, yes, it does. We had an evangelist come through here and show us where it says you can't sell your dog. I said, boy, did, did you write it down? She said, yes. Deuteronomy 23, 18, King James, do not give the hire of a dog. And those women in that church believed that and started leasing their dogs. I said to them, would you read the verse before that and the verse after that? 
And would you know that a dog in Deuteronomy is a male prostitute of the Canaanite fertility cult? And if you'd have read just the verse before it and the verse after it, that guy could not have tricked you so badly on that. But we get tricked like that all the time. Most Christians like it that way because they see Christianity as a ticket to heaven when they die. We want to trust Christ, get warm fuzzies. If we have problems, God will fix it. He'll make us healthy, wealthy, and wise. And then after we spend all our money on ourselves, 40 years later, have a real big Christian funeral. That's Western Christianity. That is not biblical Christianity. No, no, no. This is not a ticket to heaven. This is a daily, intimate, personal relationship that's meant to grow day by day into Christ's likeness. The goal of Christianity is not that you go to heaven when you die, but Christ's likeness now so others can go with you when you die. American Christianity may be the most selfish, shallowest version that the world has ever known. Why do Christians neglect personal Bible study? We're Americans, and we want instantaneous results. I, the, the example I use here, you go into some, uh, let's say you go to the hospital, and they got this coffee machine. Well, it serves coffee, hot chocolate, and tea. You can get extra bold, light, sugar, more sugar, cream, more cream. You just push button buttons. You put in your 50 cents. <laughs> you tell how old I've done this. 50 cents, and out comes this cup just the way you want. We expect that in Bible study. We want to take a pill that gives us everything. People say to me all the time, oh, I wish I had your Bible knowledge. Well, you wouldn't be sitting in a pew if you do. You'd be out in the world. Don't you tell me you want more knowledge so you can beat your relatives at Bible trivia? What do you want more knowledge for? So you can be changed into his image and thrust into the kingdom. It's just not about us. We say that, but we, we live another way. Instantaneous results is one of the reasons why I buy people. Most people say, well, I'm going to read the Bible. They get to Genesis 5 and quit. First, they can't pronounce the names, and second, they're all dead, except for Enoch. Two, they do not see it as their responsibility. Now, how many times have I heard this? Well, the preacher does that. Um, I've been so appalled at the split between clergy and laity. Now, I guarantee you there is no text in the New Testament that talks about this. This is a development of Roman Catholicism from the 300 A.D.s. Every time the word kleros is used in the New Testament, it simply refers to how the Levites put a fork into a boiling pot to get the piece of meat that they could get for the day. That's where it comes from. Every time kleros is used in the New Testament, I hope you'll check me on this, it refers to all the people of God. The word we get the word laity from is simply the Greek word for people, laos. Every time it's used, it's used for all the people of God. There is no clergy laity distinction in the New Testament. Even the verses that talk about ordination is only about three of them, and none of them say what we practice. Which means it's not their responsibility. It's Christians' responsibility. The Bible is for you. It, it's your book. It wasn't written to you, but it is written for you. The cultural trend towards specialists. I, um, you know, the older I get, the more I, different parts of my body quit. Well, if you don't know what, what doctor you're going to, they'll cut out the wrong thing. How many specialists do we have? I have an MDI doctor who sent me to a retinal specialist. Now, if he can't do it, there's a guy who does a laser. My soul, there is a specialist for everything. How many PhDs do you have to have to study the Bible? You got 20 of them. They don't agree on nothing except where to eat. And they don't agree on that. I've met some really stupid PhDs. Education cannot solve this problem. Spe how do I have to know archaeology, ancient Greek, Hebrew, uh, theology? Well, how many do I have to have? The issue is not how much specialized training do I have. The issue is an open heart and prayerful receptivity. Because the teacher is the spirit. And could I scream, God wants you to understand. It's not like if you're good this week, you don't sin, you tithe, you attend church, he'll let you know something. That's not the deal. The, the sender is sending it at full power. The problem is not the sender. The problem is the receiver. 
Most Christians don't want to know more because they'll have to change their lives. Number D or four, whichever you have. Confusion caused by so many conflicting interpretations. I remember how it discouraged I was. In my little church where I dressed surrender to preach, militant people were over their particular view of something. I mean, it was name-calling. It was, you don't believe the Bible if you don't agree with me stuff. Um, I, I just... <laughs> I just don't understand how we can pray for Bible knowledge, seek the guidance of the Spirit, and disagree so much. I don't understand it. I, I do not have an answer. But I know it's discouraging to Christians. They say, well, if, they, if the leaders can't agree, how can I agree? So just, I'm not going to try. Well, there is disagreement. And we're not going to agree on everything. But I can't tell you the peace I have in my heart by having Bible knowledge, when I hear something or see something, I can take it to a biblical worldview and not be tricked or swayed or led astray by these cultural religious fads that move through our culture and every culture. There is a peace that comes with understanding the Bible. I don't understand all of it. Uh, there are places there nobody understands. But there is such a reward <laughs> to knowing scripture for yourselves. Even though we disagree, there's such a reward. Now, under dogmatism, uh, all of us learn this closed-minded attitude toward religious truth. I, I, have you seen the bumper sticker? If the Bible says it, that settles it. People say, well, I just believe the Bible. You do not. So I just take it literally. You do not. I, I met many of you. I didn't see one of you with a poked out eye or a cut off arm, and I know you sinned. You tell me you take it literally. We take literally what fits our theology. And we ignore what doesn't. We've got to watch out for this. I know everything I need to know. None of us have arrived. None of us have the mind of God. I think the greatest arrogance we ever have is. My theology is God's theology. Really? Really? Think about that for a minute. We've got to have a little more humility and teachability. We've got to be willing to say to somebody, show me in the Bible where you got that. Let me pray about it and look at it, right? It's like only buying commentaries that agree with you. What good is that? No, buy the ones that don't agree with you and force them to show you. You mean I may have to change something I've always thought? Well. We've been indoctrinated by denominations. I always got tickled in Southern Baptist life. Whenever we talked about revelation, they always skipped the difficult passages. <laughs> they didn't want to cause conflict in the, in the Bible study. No, my, and there is going to be some, there is going to be some uh, indoctrination that occurs. I remember I went to Southwestern. Somebody else was here. Uh, they only hired professors who graduated from Southwestern. We call that inbreeding. Is, is uh, going to a Christian college, it, do we just give them the right answers to the right questions? Or do we give them the ability to analyze Scripture and walk in the light they have? Are we meant to educate or indoctrinate? Well, unfortunately, it's quite often the second, not the first. And that's true in some churches. I've had people say to me, well, you're not really a Baptist. So... If I'm a Bible Christian, you ought to be happy with that. My mother was a Baptist. Took me to church. That's how I got to be that. You think I analyzed all the denominations and picked this only right one? Holy spit, that's pretty bad. They are overly influenced by personality type, personal experience, spiritual gift. I, the next one down, I remember I was a pastor in Lubbock for 10 years, and a um, lady called me one night late. I don't know if you're a pastor or do counseling, but when the full moon is out is when the strange calls come. I'm telling you, there's the, we call it the whirlwolf effect, you know. Well, this lady called me and said, I'm in the emergency room at Methodist Hospital, and Jesus just appeared to me. It's three in the morning. 
My first reaction was, <laughs> my second reaction was, you know, that sounds like something Jesus might have done. Here's this lady in crisis alone. That, that, that's, he may have done that. Now, here's my third reaction. I've been in that hospital alone. Why didn't he appear to me? Now, watch what's happening. If it hadn't happened to me, it can't happen to her. If it happened to her, it ought to happen to me. Both of those are the wings of the bird of destruction. Just because you, uh, people say to me, uh, tell me something that happened, and I say, well, thank God that it happened to you. That hadn't happened to me. I'm not responsible for that. Uh, you just can't say, God told me what this verse means. Well, I'm happy for you that God speaks to you, but I only respond to the book, right? So you've got to walk in the light you have, but I don't have to walk in the light you have. So, <laughs> I remember I was in, when I was in seminary, I was at an associate pastor at a large church in Arlington, and um, we had a single adult group, had this lady who needed a job, and one of our men owned an insurance company, and this was the kind of lady that you say hello to her in the morning at church, and she goes, oh, God bless you, hallelujah, you know. <laughs> She didn't last very long as the answering person for the insurance company. Because <laughs> people were calling in with wrecks and tornadoes. She'd go, hallelujah, Jesus loves you, God bless. No, you just can't answer insurance phone that way. Now, that's a personality type. Do you think she's going to interpret the Bible the same way the person you ask a question, they say, well, there are four main books and three theories, and no, those guys are going to interpret the Bible differently. You have a personality type. But we're going to try to remove your personality type, remove your personal experience, remove your denominational training, remove your mother's influence and say, what did the original author say to the people of his day and how do we apply that truth to our day? Okay, we're, we're trying to cut out that 20th century Baptist evangelical bias and get back to what could this have meant in the first century. A good example of this is, we do a lot of these financial seminar kind of things, you know. I know you know, heard them. And they try to find scripture texts on how to do a financial seminar on Western capitalism. So they go to verses like, oh, no man, nothing. There it is. You can't have a credit card. Oh, slap yourself. What are we doing to the Bible? That Paul was not thinking about modern consumer credit. You can make the Bible say anything doing that. Pulling little pieces out, ignoring the historical setting, and applying those words literally to something in, you, in your day. That's not biblical truth. That's biblical manipulation. I'm over it. There are basically four sources of how we receive uh, truth or revelation or understanding. I've listed those for you there. Um, I, for us as a Christian, revelation is the most important. We believe scripture really has a unique authoritative position. Rationalism, I'm going to try to say to you, how do I, I, I as a normal a person with human language and education in my culture, how do I pass on my understanding of God to other people in my culture? I have to do it with reason. I have to do it with illustrations. I have to do it with, with logic. Well, that, that some people... That's the ultimate, is, is rationalism. I would say no, but it is a way we learn truth. Experience. I know this is true because it happened to me. Well, uh, uh, experience is wonderful. Thank God for Christian experience. But what's happened to you is not automatically God's will for every person everywhere. Experience can't be the engine of this thing. Thank God for it, but it can't be the engine. And then uh, tradition. You know, can't you see Fiddler on the Roof now? Tradition, tradition. It's, it reminded me of a story about, why, you've heard this, I know, why the, the mother always cut the end off the ham, you know, and they asked the grandmother, and she said, well, I just had a little pan. See, suddenly a family tradition happened because of a small pan. I had a man in my family would not eat Thanksgiving turkey unless you cut the butt of the turkey off before you cooked it. Now, I don't know what the butt of that turkey ever did to that man, but, it, it, boy, he was dogmatic. It's a tradition. He couldn't get over it. He couldn't have a meal with his family because they didn't cut the end of the turkey off. Now, surely you don't have that in your Bible understanding. 
Surely spit, dance, and chew is not your ultimate moral authority. South America, if you use any form of tobacco, they won't let you trust Christ or join the church. Think about that a minute. I try to talk to them. Wait a minute. The, the Bible doesn't talk about this. Yes, it does. It talks about your body is a temple and smoking hurts it. Okay, you big weenie. What about those three Big Macs I saw you eat for lunch? And you're 100 pounds overweight, and you're going to tell me I can't smoke because I hurts my body? That's the kind of arrogance we do to one another. And claim the Bible backs it up. I told you I was emotional. An intentional, personal price must be paid to know the Bible. What, what price is it? Every time you pick up this book, you ought to pray, God, please forgive me for my sins and help me understand your word. Prayer is crucial. Every, you cannot understand this book with your education, your giftedness, and your cultural setting. We need spiritual help. Amen? This is God's book, and we must have the Spirit involved. Number two, persistence. If, and when I show you what to do and you try it once and it doesn't work well, you need to try it again. And if I see you in five years, you'll hug my neck. Training. That's what you're doing today. Thank you. Thank you for coming. How many could have come and chose not to? You chose to take a Saturday to how to study God's Word. I, I just so honor your choice and thank you so much for giving me a chance to... Uh, Share with you my life's calling um, and training. Regular study. You need to have a regular time, a quiet place, and, and study through a, one book of the Bible at a time. Reading through the Bible in one year sounds great, but it is self-defeating because nobody can receive that much knowledge that quick. If you would spend a year on Romans, you wouldn't be tricked anymore. So this whole goal is to say at the end of this day, I'm going to say pick a small New Testament book. I'm going to give you the resources and procedures, and I'm going to ask you to try it. Not you. Quiet time, quiet place. Mothers say to me, I have three kids. I don't have a quiet time in a quiet place. It's one lady said, the only time I ever have is a bubble bath twice a week. Take the Bible in there with you. That's all. We're not, I'm not saying 10 hours a day. Quiet time, a quiet place, and work through one book because every book of the Bible is a consistent message. And we don't have the right to pick a few verses out and say, thus saith the Lord. You wouldn't like that. I found one of your letters. Okay, what I'm presenting you, this is not my opinion. I am presenting you an ancient church Bible study method. Now, just real quickly, do a little history. There are two major schools of Bible interpretation developed in the early church. One, at Alexandria, Egypt. It developed in the second century. It's called allegory. One developed about 200 years later in Antioch of Syria at the church where that sent out Paul and Barnabas. And it's called the literal school or the historical grammatical school. What I'm presenting to you is the Antioch version. Now what I've done is taken an ancient church method of interpreting the Bible and I've tried to put it in modern Western outline form. I've tried to take their approach from the 300s and say here is a way to, to do this approach today. So the, the breaking it down method is Bob. The approach is the ancient church, okay? The historical, grammatical, or literal method of interpretation offers us a consistent and verifiable approach to personal Bible study. Now, why that's so important is I need to be able to say, if I hear a sermon, if I hear a Sunday school teaching, if I read a Christian book, I need to take what they're saying through some kind of filter and evaluate, right? Right? I don't want to critique, I don't want to be ugly, but I need to be able to evaluate input I'm getting in the name of God. And just because they have a suit and a degree and a big church does not mean it's from God. How do I evaluate? Okay, I need to look at 
Could this have been what the original hearers understood? Did I read the whole message? Are there any unique grammatical features? What was the contemporary meaning of the words? What kind of literature is this? Is it poetry? Is it apocalyptic? Is it prophecy? Is it letter? Is it gospel? And every one of those has different ways to understand it. So, I remember Garden Fee is probably my favorite Bible commentator. I remember him saying, it shocked me so much when he said it. The most important element in Bible interpretation is common sense. If you read something, it seems to say one thing, and this scholar says, no, no, it doesn't mean that. It means exactly the opposite, run. Common sense. God wants you to understand. We've got to keep that in our mind. He's not hiding things from us. He wants us to understand. And he's given us a book, and he's given us the Spirit, and now it's up to us. Okay. Um, our presuppositions about the Bible itself are the first determinative factor. So I'm going to give you my basic presuppositions. If you agree with me on most of this, you'll enjoy this seminar. If you have real problems with what I'm saying, you probably won't. Number one, the Bible came from God. <laughs> 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. He wants us to know him and his will. He is speaking we are not listening. Number two, the Bible, like hermeneutics, is not an end in itself, but a, a means of meeting God through Christ. We don't need a book. We need God. Amen? The Bible is not to be worshipped. I don't bow down to my Bible. But the Bible is the only way I know about Jesus. How else do I know about Jesus? What he said, what he did, how he lived. How else do I understand creation? How else do I understand the fall? The Bible gives me a worldview, gives me a way to understand reality. So I, I desperately need that. But I don't need information. I need God. Augustine said it so well. There's a God-shaped hole in every person. And you can put money and fame and drugs and power and sex and whatever you want to in that. And it won't fulfill you. But when you find God, then all the things in life certainly have a place and enjoyment. Uh, number three, the Bible is written in normal human language. It is culturally and historically conditioned. Yes, the Spirit spoke clearly and not with hidden meaning. There's no tricks here. Now, the, the Spirit spoke clearly to the people that the author was writing to. But we're 2,000 plus years away from that. So it's going to take us a little effort to get back in the place of that original hearer. The Bible is primarily redemptive for all human beings. The goal of Scripture is not, boy, do I understand. No, the goal of Scripture is, wow, I'm saved. <laughs> Bible is meant to bring fallen man back into fellowship with himself. So the goal is always redemptive. The first goal is redemptive. It's not informational first. It's redemptive first. The priority is the Great Commission. Go into all the world and make disciples. Then... Teach them all that I've taught you, right? The Bible is primarily redemptive for all human beings, number four. Number five, the Holy Spirit is an indispensable guide, but we must balance human effort, rightly dividing the word of truth, a workman not to be ashamed, right? You know that Second Timothy text. And the Spirit's guidance. We need to spray, uh, pray for the Spirit's help. Then we need to make as good of effort as we can and trying to understand it. People say, well, that's, that's kind of contradictory. Well, when my kids are sick, I got a call last night. I, my daughter-in-law may have a brain tumor. Now, what do we do? We get down and pray, and we tell her to go see the specialist. Now, is that conflicting? I don't not think it is. I think both those have a place, right? I pray as if it all depends on the great physician, and then I encourage her to go see somebody who's an expert in the area. Well, I think the same is true of the Spirit. I need to know that he's the only one that can really teach. He's the only one that has authoritative truth. But I must come. I must be available. Uh, I must make a commitment to Bible study. Okay. 
Interpretation is a spiritual gift. I hear this all the time. People say, well, Bob, it's obviously you have a, a, the gift of teaching. And so this is, this is for you. But really, I don't have that gift. I have another gift. So it's, this is not my thing. Okay, okay. Let's just, let me chase this rabbit. Uh, if someone said to you, you know, I don't have the gift of prayer. So I don't pray. Or someone said, oh, well, you know, I don't have the gift of giving. So I just don't give. I don't have the gift of evangelism, so I don't ever share my faith. You would say, wait a minute. All Christians participate at some level with all the gifts, right? So you may not have the gift of teaching, but you're responsible before God for what you know and how you've lived it. Now, I think we're only going to stand before God for what we've understood and how we lived it out. You're not responsible for my knowledge. I'm not responsible for yours. But I need to gain more and more knowledge to make sure it's really information from God and not from culture. Much of what Baptists believe have nothing to do with the Bible. Have everything to do with Southern American 20th century culture. The Bible has a spiritual dimension which goes beyond our day. I'm, I'm thinking about Daniel 12 where he's, it, verse 9 it says, seal this up for the future. It wasn't for Daniel, it was for the future. Many people think that everything in the Bible is for them. I assure you there's some text in the Bible that will become radically literal when the last generation of suffering Christians appears. You are a spoiled group that gripe over the air conditioner. <laughs> you are not a group of persecuted Christians yet. So, uh, some of the Bible is sealed up for the future. We fight over it because it's not our day. I remember years ago, I got, I want to say tickled, but it was really, it's a worse word. Um, Chernobyl, the, the, the reactor had a meltdown, and somebody found that the word Chernobyl in Russian means wormwood, and Revelation says there's a star going to fall burning up and turn the waters into wormwood, and now we know it's the last day. Or somebody told, I remember this too, Henry Kissinger in Hebrew equals 666. Now we know. Or how about there's a computer in Belgium that takes all our MasterCards. It's called the Beast. Now we know what the, get over it. You can't read the morning newspaper and an ancient Hebrew text and just relate them. It reminds me of the code book. You know that? I hope you all have, aren't into that, but... The code book took, e took every Hebrew word in the Masoretic text, put it in a computer, picked every 123rd word, and that turned into prophecies about America. Who do you think you are? So God hid a message to America in an ancient Hebrew text? I could make Mary have a little lamb make a miracle to America if you let me do something like that. Why do we get tricked by that? Because I want to know more than you. Oh, I really got the truth. If you got Jesus, you got the truth, get over it. The Bible, oh, excuse me, the Spirit will help us find the central truth, the basic message, not every detail. No, we're not going to, we can't pray more and solve every issue. There are texts that nobody knows what they mean. But he'll help us find the basic issue. Are there any English teachers in here? English teachers? Well, it's probably better. We got one. Where? English. Uh, would you, uh, I don't put you on the spot. Would you define for me a paragraph? What, what for you is a paragraph? About that topic, yes? Now, this is not Bob, right? You've heard this in, you heard this in English. The way we know what a paragraph is, is a unified topic, right? Usually a, a topical sentence, topical thought. Every sentence illustrates, explains, limits that thought. The smallest, the smallest part of the Bible we should ever try to interpret is a paragraph. Never a sentence, never a word, never a clause. Words only have meaning in sentences. Sentences only have meaning in paragraphs. So, the Spirit is going to help us find the basic meaning at paragraph level. Not the details of an illustration, uh, the details of a certain word. 
paragraphs are the key to studying the Bible. I'll go over this again and again and again. Now, the problem is that paragraphs do not have a textual marker. I can't prove to you what paragraphs are. Uh, have any of you looked at my Bible commentaries online? Anybody? It's very discouraging. Well, okay. Um, <laughs> at the beginning of every chapter, I do a comparison of five English translations based on different translation theories for New Testament, including the, the, the Greek text. And I try to show you how these committees of translators find the paragraphs in the chapter. And as a teacher or a preacher, the question is, how many main points does the original author give in his message in this section? And the key is paragraphs. If there are four paragraphs, there are four main points. If there's one paragraph, there's one main point. We want to present the author's outline, not my outline. Amen? So paragraphs become the key, both for outlining what is the message and how do I present the message. So it becomes really important. The Bible does not dire directly address every modern question. Yeah, you, can't, you, you can't find nuclear war in the Bible. You can't answer, should we do stem cell research? Then these are questions the Bible was not meant to answer. There are, there are sometimes principles that guide us, yes, but... You've got to know this is an ancient book and the questions they had are not the questions we have. And that's true about Genesis. I, there's so much fighting in the church. I personally do not believe Genesis is the when or the how of creation. I believe Genesis 1 is the who and the why of creation. Now see, that changes the whole fight. I don't want to fight with the age of the earth. I want to fight with there is a creator. Right? My fight is not with evolution. My fight is with naturalism. That it all just happened accidentally. Now, I can't live with that. I don't know how God did it. I'm, I'm convinced God is God and I'll let him do what he wants to, right? Okay, um, let's go to the historical grammatical method. It is the only method of interpretation that provides controls on interpretation. It allows limited verification and consistency. Authorial intent, contextual, literary context, grammatical features, contemporary meaning of words, and historical setting provide the norm for a rational interpretation and evaluation. So what I'm going to say, if I read something in Paul that's addressing, let's just take... Um, 1 Corinthians 15, you know that famous text, it's on what? The resurrection, amen? It's an Easter text. In that, it talks about baptism for the dead. Nobody knows what baptism for the dead is. The Mormons don't either. But it's in a series, a series of illustrations. What is the purpose of... Of the series of illustrations is the real key not do I understand what baptism for the dead is. Once I see how this little verse fits into a larger structure, it takes away the necessity to know for sure what it means. All these illustrations are, are, are talking about something there. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Um, this is a quote from Garden Fee. A Bible that can mean anything means nothing. I want you to think about that. If one preacher can bend the nose over here, another preacher bend the nose over here. If you just go to a church and 20 preachers have three, 20 different sermons on the same text, something is wrong. Now, there can be 20 applications. Yes, yes, yes. But there cannot be 20 meanings. And I have to know the meaning before I can do the application. And I need to know, is this person telling me truth? Our personal opinion. I once had a pastor say to me, I wanted to slap this brother so bad. He said, when I come from behind the pulpit, I speak for myself. And when I stand behind the pulpit, I speak for God. And my thought was, do you ever forget? <laughs> no, no, no. You, no. No, no, we can't do it that way. Sorry. No. Sometimes your underwear gets, you got, never mind. <clears throat> the only method for interpretation is controls on interpretation. It is not a method for scholars. People often say to me, well, Bob, you're depreciating your position. You, you're absolutely right. 
I'm getting myself out of the spotlight and I'm putting you in the spotlight. Absolutely I am. Do you need me? I can be helpful at a certain point. But what you need is the Holy Spirit and inspired revelation. Now, I maybe can help you on some of the words or some of the phrases, some of the historical say, Yeah, let me help you at some point after you've prayed, you've read. For the common man, faith seeking understanding. However, the difference in languages and culture requires some research. It must be interpreted in light of the original author's purpose, the original author's historical setting, and the original author's complete message. Interpretation is a focused attempt to use the same procedures done unconsciously in ordinary human communication through written text. When you read the paper this morning, if you still read the paper instead of online, you read an article. And your, your wonderful God-given mind, which I think is part of the image of God in man, you could tell very quickly, this is meant to be an editorial comment. This is meant to be a fact-based article. This is sarcasm. This is humor. This, this is advertisement. Your mind, after a few sentences, goes, ah, what kind, of, what kind of writing is this? And you know. So what I'm saying here is, the whole point is that you unconsciously have this ability to understand written text. And all I'm doing is taking that God-given ability and saying, you're practicing that today. I'm putting a structure on it and I'm trying to do it for an ancient language. Um, you know that airline pilots, professional airline pilots, take off and land thousands, tens of thousands of times in their career, right? Did you know every time they take off and land, they go through a checklist? Because as good as they are and experienced as they are, the human mind tends to skip stages. This, this seminar is meant to be a Bible interpretation take off and landing guide. Did I check? Did I check? Did I check? Did I check? Uh, how about the mechanics toolbox? Big red toolbox. Five drawers. Got all these tools. You don't use all those tools for every repair, do you? But that mechanic needs to know those tools are there. And when a certain problem happens, that mechanic knows which tool perfectly fits and perfectly works for that repair. That is, I'm going to give you the toolbox. I'm going to show you how these tools fit. Now, you've got to decide if you're going to choose to learn how to use that toolbox. The decision is yours. You know, in some ways, I'm not giving you, and this is not a favor for me coming today because you may have come in here somewhat naive about your responsibility. But when you leave here today, you will be responsible to God for how you treat the Bible. What type of literature? We use the word genre. What we mean is there's a difference between the way I write my mother and the way I write my lawyer. There's a difference between gospel and letter. There's a difference between poetry and um, apocalyptic. I, David, I remember at school when I was a student there. I'm not going to tell you when because I just don't want you to know. Um, I was a student there. And I remember a, boy, it was a radical time. Somebody said to me, do you believe that the trees clap their hands and the hills skip like rams i said i think that's poetry and this guy said i knew you didn't believe the bible <laughs> contemporary meaning of words sometimes words we think we know what they mean but really the original context it meant something else i was in i do a lot of evangelism crusades i was in i think i was in nicaragua or somewhere i love to kid people so i was kidding my translator and he said to me, oh, Bob, please don't molest me anymore. Hey, brother, the, the word molest does not mean in English what it means. He meant, don't kid me, right? Don't, don't play with me. For, for me as an English person, it had a whole different context, right? It's a sexual element involved in that for me. He had no clue when he said that. We do that to biblical words. We read into them what we think the connotation is from English when they have no idea that connotation originally. Um, okay. Now, number four, under C4, I think, is my notes. You should be close to that. The difficulty interpreting ancient texts multiply because 
knowledge of any given language from the past is limited. Uh, you know, most preachers uh, in seminary take, uh, for Baptists, take two years. Uh, Dallas Seminary has three years for Greek. We in Sim Southwestern had one year for Hebrew. Dallas has two. They focus on the ancient languages. But uh, I always get tickled when preacher says, the Greek says, as if two years of any language makes you competent to do anything. That's like a third grade maybe level. Maybe level. Uh, none of us know ancient Koine Greek. There's probably 10 people in the world that know ancient Koine Greek. If you have to know the original language before you can interpret the Bible, none of us could interpret the Bible. A translation is adequate. We are not Islamic. You do not have to learn the Quran in Arabic to understand God. God wants to save the world, so translations are adequate for people to know God. Knowledge of the author's intent is an assumption. I never am sure this was the author's intent. I'm looking for it. I'm looking for evidence for it. I can never be 100% certain. Knowledge of the purpose of selected genres. Do I know exactly what apocalyptic literature is? Did God give John on the Isle of Patmos the, the, the imagery or did God give John the message and John put it in a certain form? I can't answer that question. I believe it's from God. I just don't, I don't believe it was dictated to him. So did John use his own mind to structure the message? Or did God structure the message? I don't think I can answer that. A knowledge of idioms and metaphorical language is uncertain. Now what I'm saying is, I don't always know when the Bible is being literal or idiomatic. Let me, let me take a couple examples. Remember where Job's wife, if you read English, she said, um, curse God and die. The word in Hebrew is bless. The word bless can mean curse or bless depending on the context. How about the word hate? Uh, years ago when I was still in, in, in college, the Moonies were very popular. They go to a college state campus. They would say to young Christians, do you believe the Bible? The Bible says you've got to hate father and mother and love me. Come with us. Don't cut off your parents' communication. Hundreds of kids left college and their parents and went with the Moonies because of that verse. But the word hate in Hebrew is not the English word hate. It means it's a comparative term. Um, Jacob loved Rachel and hated Leah. He didn't hate Leah. She just wasn't the favorite. Amen? It's, it's a gradation of importance. It doesn't mean hate like we think that. You've got to know how the word is being used and not just... How many times in a sermon have I heard somebody say, Webster Dictionary says, who cares what Webster's English Dictionary says if we're doing an ancient Greek text? I'm over it. Some general statements about the seminar. Um, and we'll, I'll take a break in 10 minutes, okay? So hang on. Sinfulness affects everyone, including me. It affects my interpretation, the way I put the Bible together, the way I try to apply the Bible. Filter what is presented through your spirit-led understanding. Do not accept anything I say without it checking me. Now, I'm trying to lead you into areas you're going to feel uncomfortable with at first. I know that. I prayed a whole lot before I came. I hope you prayed for me before you walked in this building. If not, you don't get the deal. I want to stretch you. I hope you'll let me stretch you. But you, at the end, you've got to say, well, I, I just don't really like that. I agree with this, but not this. You have the spirit like I do. You, you've got to pray about this and think through this. New insights and theological adjustments are painful but necessary. Let me challenge your traditions and see if they're biblical. Biblical. Somebody said, well, I, I understand all I want to know. If you, this is, I'm, I'm a rude person, you're going to find out. If you have not had a new thought about God in five years, you're not mature, you're brain dead. You think God, you, you've reached a plateau now, huh? You know all you need to know. You carry the flag on. No, we're all students. We're all learning. We never arrive. No, no. So painful. I remember some of the things I was taught in my church by people I loved and trust. I remember things my mother said to me because of her experiences in church. It took me 20 years to work through my mother's problems.
In order to help under, uh, open our understanding, this seminar will employ controversial examples. Please hear what I say, because I, I am, if I don't make you mad, your hearing aid battery's gone. Because I'm going to bring up every fight we ever had. Why? Just to, just to throw rocks? No. To show valid alternate interpretations. To show inappropriate interpretations. To illustrate hermeneutical principles. To get and to keep your attention and interest. Now, you may be so mad at me over something I say, write it down and talk to me in private or in a question time. But if you crank on something I said you don't like and you don't hear anything else for the next 30 minutes, that's not going to work well, right? You're not going to agree with me. I, don't want, I have said I don't want you to agree. We're not going to vote. But I think you believe a lot of strange things have nothing to do with the Bible. And you've been told a lot of strange things. Now, I'm going to... I'm a conservative Bible teacher. I'm going to put these worms on the table. I cannot get these worms back in the jar. You know that, right? But I think it's better as a conservative Bible teacher to show you the worms than answer all the questions about the worms. Because I don't want someone knocking on your door and saying, let me show you something that your church never told you. The examples are meant to illustrate the methodology. They are not meant to be definitive. They are meant to be thought-provoking. Christian maturity is a painful, tension-filled road of self-examination and spirit-led Bible study. Why take the time to study hermeneutics? Believers must be able to self-feed. Too many Christians are tricked or sidetracked by minor issues. Believers must participate in regular Bible study, both corporately and individually. Believers must remember how great a privilege it is to have a written revelation from God. But this privilege is also an awesome responsibility for ourselves, our families, our friends, and our faith communities. So, that's the introduction. <laughs> uh, the next section is the Bible itself. And uh, I see it's 10 after 10. Can we take 10 minutes, let you go to the bathroom, get some coffee? Now, most of the learning in this session is going to talk when you talk to each other. It's fair to bring up anything I say to each other. Amen? In the hallway, in the bathroom, in the lunch. I am I'm not going to be offended. I want to engender you talking to each other. I like that. I didn't like that. I don't know what he meant here. Th that's why online education is not as good as classroom education. Because the real education occurs when you talk about what the professor presented, okay? Feel free to talk. You're not going to offend me. I'm not going to offend you. Deal? Deal. Ten minutes.